On October the 25th, 1854, a simple bugle call sent 600 men of the British cavalry riding into history. I am Trumpeter Landry, one of the surviving Trumpeters in charge of the Light Brigade in Balaclava. I am now going to sound the charge as was sounded at Balaclava on that very same bugle. On the 25th of October, 1854, The Light Brigade charged the Russian guns. 30 minutes later, one in six of them were dead. This is the story of the Crimean War, told in the words and pictures of those who were there. In October 1854, a British fleet was anchored in the narrow bay at Balaclava Harbour on Russia's southern shores. Britain, France and Turkey had invaded the Crimea, intent on destroying the Tsar's Black Sea stronghold at Sebastopol. On October the 25th, a Russian army attacked the British camp just outside Balaclava, trying to push them back into the sea. Early that morning, they forced the Turks to abandon their artillery positions defending the town. From a hilltop just outside Balaclava, the British commander, Lord Raglan, could see the Russians across the valley, dragging away the captured guns. Now, all that could stop them was the cream of the British cavalry, the Light Brigade. The light brigade down in the valley couldn't see the Turkish guns behind this hill. The only guns they could see belonged to the main Russian army at the far end of the valley. Cavalryman Albert Mitchell described what happened next. We could see the enemy had placed a number of guns across the lower part of the valley, nearly a mile and a half from us. At the same time, a field battery ascended a hill on our left front where it was placed in a position facing us. Things were in this state when Captain Nolan came galloping down and handed a paper to Lord Lucan. Lord Raglan wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front. Follow the enemy and try to prevent the enemy carrying away the guns. Troop horse artillery may accompany. French cavalry is on your left. Immediate. Cavalry commander Lord Lucan asked for clarification. Nolan replied, Lord Raglan's orders are that the cavalry should attack immediately. Attack, sir? Attack what? What guns, sir? There, my lord, is your enemy. There are your guns. The brigade was ordered to advance down the valley towards the main Russian position. Raglan's message had been misunderstood. A 34-year-old Irishman, William Howard Russell, the world's first war correspondent, was watching from the hillside. They swept proudly past, glittering in the morning sun in all the pride and splendor of war. We could scarcely believe the evidence of our senses. Surely that handful of men are not going to charge an army in position. Alas, it was but too true. Suddenly, Captain Nolan rode up to Light Brigade Commander Lord Cardigan. Was he trying to redirect the charge? Before he could speak, a shell splinter pierced his chest. 
Russian guns on both sides of the valley, as well as in the battery ahead, were now pouring a tremendous cannonade on the advancing cavalry. The Allied commanders on the heights could finally see the charge for what it was. Spectacular, but suicidal. They saw perfectly that uh, at the end of the valley, there were uh, Russian guns waiting for them. And they thought that it was completely against all the rules of the military art to charge uh, guns the, this way. So uh, that's why the General Bosque had this uh, famous words, c'est magnifique, mais ce n'est pas la guerre. C'est de la folie. Madness or not, the light brigade was now galloping towards the guns. As we drew near, the guns in our front supplied us liberally with grape and canister, which brought down men and horses in heaps. Up to this time, I was going on all right, but missed my left-hand man from my side, and thinking it might soon be my turn, offered up a short prayer. Oh, Lord, protect me and watch over my poor mother. Private Albert Mitchell. Galloping behind Mitchell was butcher Jack Fahey, still wearing his butcher's apron and wielding his axe. Nearer and nearer we came to the dreadful battery, which kept vomiting death on us like a volcano, till I seemed to feel on me cheek the hot air from the cannon's mouth. At last we were on it. Half a dozen of us leapt in among the guns at once, and I, with one blow of me axe, brained a Russian gunner just as he was clapping the linstock to the touch hole of his piece. Having smashed through the line of guns at the end of the valley, the light brigade were confronted by massed ranks of Russian cavalry. They charged again until overwhelming numbers forced them to retreat. Lord Cardigan's dashing second in command, Lord George Paget, who had kept a cheroot clenched between his teeth throughout the charge, led his men back through the carnage. The Light Brigade now had to run the gauntlet of Russian cannons again, but relief was at hand. A French cavalry regiment, the Chasseurs d'Afrique, had been waiting for an opportunity to help the retreating Light Brigade. They charged the Russian battery on the hillside, forcing the gunners to withdraw. The brigade struggled back down the valley. Wounded men and dismounted troopers flying towards us told the sad tale. Demigods could not have done what we had failed to do. At 35 minutes past 11, not a British soldier, except the dead and dying, was left in front of these bloody Muscovite guns. William Howard Russell. Three hundred and sixty-two horses were killed. Of some 630 men who charged, 110 were killed in action. A hundred and ninety-six were wounded. And 57 taken prisoner. For the rest of the war, the Light Brigade were to be little more than spectators. But the Russians never forgot the British courage at Balaclava, nor risked another encounter with their cavalry. Reports of the battle sent home concentrated on the valor of the Light Brigade, the stupidity of sending cavalry to charge cannons was forgotten. Poets, painters and the press all rushed to turn disaster into glory. Within weeks, the poet laureate Alfred Lord Tennyson had immortalised the Light Brigade in verse. Tennyson recorded his poem for posterity in 1890. All in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the Light Brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600.
While Tennyson was writing his poem at home, a Scottish painter and illustrator, William Simpson, had arrived in the Crimea. The Battle of Balaclava had taken place before I arrived, but it was necessary for me to give pictures. I could easily make sketches on the ground, but I had to trust to those on the spot for a description of the events. The most important eyewitness Simpson consulted was the Light Brigade commander, Lord Cardigan, but it took several visits to his yacht in Balaclava Harbour before the artist's third sketch met with Cardigan's approval. I went on board a third time and was rewarded with the warmest praise and was able to send it home with the expression of Lord Cardigan's highest admiration. The real truth was that in the last sketch, I had taken greater care than in the first two to make his lordship conspicuous in the front of the brigade. Simpson's vetted watercolours received the same privileged treatment as Raglan's own dispatches from the front and were sent home on the first available ship. Though there was no censorship, William Howard Russell's reports and ordinary soldiers' letters were often delayed in Balaclava to ensure that the official version of events got home first. Two weeks after Balaclava, the Russians camped on the heights at Inkerman prepared for another assault on the Allies across the valley. At four o'clock in the morning on November the 5th, Pyotr Alabin made a note in his diary. The rain has made thick mud, which makes our ascent more difficult. The regiments are beginning to move. Our horses are being saddled. We put the samovar on the embers of the fire and drank our fill of tea, perhaps for the last time. The regiments are standing at attention. It's time to close my diary. And will I ever open these precious pages again? The Russian plan was to steal across the river at dawn and advance up the hill to attack the British batteries, while a continuous barrage from inside Sebastopol distracted the French. Once again, the British were unprepared. Russian guns were devastating the British camp before the Allies even knew what was happening. The men of the division had just returned off trench duty, and some were preparing breakfast. Others enjoying a short sleep, but were soon aroused by a rough salute from the enemy's guns ploughing up the ground and tearing the tents down about their ears, and the poor fellows offer them naked under the blankets. Sergeant Richard Barnum, 2nd Division. The 2nd Division's commander was General Pennyfather, whose rule of thumb in battle was, whenever you see a head, hit it. This was good advice for a battle of skirmishes, fought in thick fog and on ground covered with dense scrub. 28-year-old Captain Henry Clifford was with a group which hurried to Pennyfather's support. In a letter home, he wrote, Dear friends and relations, At daybreak, fire of musketry was heard to our extreme right. On reaching the ground of the 2nd Division, it was evident from the roll of musketry the enemy was in great force and had driven back our pickets. Most unfortunately, the weather was very foggy and we could only be guided by the sound of the firing. Suddenly, Clifford saw a large group of Russians emerging from the fog, only 15 yards away. It was a moment or two before I could make General Buller believe they were Russians. In God's name, I said, fix bayonets and charge. He gave the order, and in another moment we were hand to hand with them. I drew my sword and cut off one man's arm who was in the act of bayonetting me, and a second, seeing it, turned round and was in the act of running out of my way when I hit him over the back of the neck and laid him dead at my feet. I saw one poor fellow's head carried away by a shot and some ten or a dozen blown into the air by a shell. Elsewhere on the battlefield, things were going better for the Russians. Under cover of their artillery, Captain Haldasyevich and his men swiftly overran the British sandbag battery. Forward with the bayonet, shouted I. I scrambled up the battery and saw by their red coats that we were engaged with the English guards. They retired about 400 yards and opened the fire of rifles upon us. 20-year-old Sergeant Timothy Gowing of the 7th Fusiliers saw the Russian assault from the sharp end of their bayonets. Our loss was heavy. Three generals fell and every mounted officer. But our men fought to the bitter end and stood triumphantly on the rocky ridge cheering for victory. The guards, all must admit, set a glorious example. For if they had to die, they acted upon the old 57th motto, let us die hard.
British officers on horseback made easy targets, and the high rank of many of the casualties convinced the Russians that victory was at hand. Early that morning, when General Bosquet first heard firing, he had offered French assistance to General Cathcart and Lord George Brown. This had been politely refused. With Cathcart now dead and Brown badly wounded, Bosquet decided to act anyway. Sweating, our uniforms sticking to our backs with the rain, we chased each other through the bush, and flam, someone got hit with the butt of a rifle, and flam, someone got a bayonet in the stomach, and oh, someone got a bullet between the eyes. They just kept coming, and we had to continue the massacre. It was kill or be killed. Sergeant Polzak, Regiment of Suaves. Finally, the British brought up their own artillery, which together with the French assault proved decisive. The Russians retreated. General Bosquet described the abandoned sandbag battery as an abattoir. The battle had lasted eight hours and 10,000 Russians lay dead. The following day, Captain Clifford, who painted these watercolours, came across one of the Russians he had wounded during the battle. This morning, as I passed the Russians, prisoners and wounded, a man amongst them ran up and called out to me and pointed to his shoulder bound up. It was the poor fellow whose arm I had cut off yesterday. He laughed and said, Bono Johnny. I took his hand and shook it heartily and the tears came in my eyes. I had not a shilling in my pocket. Had I had a bag of gold, he should have had it. Our loss has been a sad one, and we are but ill able to stand such victories. Adieu, Henry. The Allies' victory at Inkerman had taken them no nearer Sebastopol, but had inflicted horrendous casualties on both sides, for which the medical staff and facilities were to prove utterly inadequate. Already thousands had died of disease and on the battlefield, and yet the British had very little in the way of organized medicine for the growing numbers of sick and wounded. The French army had uniformed vivandières, at least one to each regiment. The vivandières looked after the rations and repaired the men's clothes, as well as tending the sick and wounded. The British had no equivalent. Each regiment had been allowed to bring out six wives per hundred married men, but such women were neither uniformed, trained, nor paid. Some managed to eke out a living doing laundry, but many ended up needing nursing themselves. Fanny Jubilee, the 24-year-old wife of a well-to-do cavalry officer, was shocked at the British situation. We have no ambulance wagons. They are nearly all broken down, or the mules are dead, or the drivers are dead or dead drunk, as well one as the other as far as usefulness goes. The French have provided transports for us for some time. Why cannot we tend to our own sick? Why are we so helpless and so broken down? Worse still, the main British hospital was housed in a filthy barracks at Scutari in Turkey, three or four days by ship from the Allied base at Balaclava. But one woman in London who had been following the war in the press was determined to do something to help. Florence Nightingale was the 34-year-old manager of a women's hospital in Harley Street, London. She wrote to the government proposing a private expedition to Scutari. She was quickly appointed superintendent of the female nursing establishment of the military hospitals in Turkey, and 38 nurses were selected to accompany her to the barracks hospital. The British medical authorities had given the hospital a clean bill of health. Nightingale was unconvinced. Barrack Hospital Scutari, 25th of November. When we came here, there was neither basin, towel, nor soap in the wards, nor any means of personal cleanliness for the wounded except the following. 30 were to be bathed every night, but this does not do more than include a washing once in 80 days for 2,300 men. The consequences of all this are fever, Cholera, gangrene, lice, bugs, fleas, from the using of one sponge in many wounds. 
With the funds at her disposal, she bought soap and basins and organized the complete cleaning of the hospital. Every day, she paced the miles of corridors, then returned to her room writing letters full of new requests to the authorities at home. January the 8th, 1855. The fact is that I am now clothing the British Army. The sick were re-embarked at Balaclava for these hospitals without recovering their kits, also half-naked besides. And when discharged from here, they carry off, small blame to them. Even my knives and forks, shirts, of course, and hospital clothing also. In all our corridors, I think we have not an average of three limbs per man. We have four miles of beds, and not 18 inches apart. Yet in the midst of this appalling horror, we are steeped up to our necks in blood. There is good. As I went my night rounds among the newly wounded, there was not one murmur, not one groan. The strictest discipline, the most absolute silence and quiet prevailed. Only the step of the sentry. The poor fellows bear pain and mutilation with unshrinking heroism and die or are cut up without a complaint. The myth of Florence Nightingale is this rather serene woman floating down the corridors at night holding the lamp and gazing tenderly at the wounded, which is very far from the real Florence Nightingale. She did, in fact, walk around the barracks every night in order to see that the soldiers were being well cared for, to see if there were any who wanted to talk, to write letters home. She took a very close interest in them, but she wasn't this ethereal figure. She was a very practical woman. She liked to do some nursing, but that she knew that that was not what her great skill was. She was able to cajole and threaten the orderlies so they kept the place clean in a way it never had been before. She was able to persuade the doctors that they had thought of the changes themselves. She was, above all, a brilliant administrator. As cleaning became the nurse's main duty, Welsh nurse Elizabeth Davis was one of several who felt they could be more useful in a strictly medical role nearer the front. Against Florence's wishes, she left Scutari and went to Balaclava. One soldier there had been wounded at Alma by a shot which passed through his left breast above the heart and came out below the shoulder blade. His wound had not been dressed for five weeks and I took at least a quart of maggots from it. From many other patients I removed them in handfuls. When the wounds were regularly attended to, these men soon got well. I do not believe that maggots ever occur in cases where the wounds are properly cleansed and dressed. I always consider their presence as proof of neglect. Interesting enough, at the same time as Florence Nightingale was collecting her nurses in London, in Russia there was a realisation that nothing was being done for the wounded in Sebastopol. So one of the Grand Duchesses set up a group known as the Sisters of Mercy who were taken to Sebastopol to nurse the wounded there. They arrived after Florence Nightingale had arrived, but they were able to have a more immediate effect probably than Florence Nightingale did because they were on the spot. They actually went down and looked after the wounded on the battlefield. Russia's top surgeon, Nikolai Perigoff, was invited to take charge. Like Nightingale, Perigoff was convinced that administration, not medicine, plays the major role in helping the sick and wounded. I spend from eight in the morning until six at night in the hospital, where the blood flows in rivers. Arriving in Sebastopol 18 days after Inkerman, I found over 2,000 wounded, all lumped together lying on dirty mattresses, soaked with blood. Who do they take these soldiers for? Who will fight well when he is convinced that the wounded will be thrown down like dogs? Surgical operations were performed simultaneously on three operating tables. Paragoff could complete an amputation in seven minutes, undertaking or supervising some 5,000 operations in 10 months. Russian nurse Yek Yatarina Bakunina served with Birakov in the nobles' assembly, working long hours in the operating rooms. In one letter, she describes a typical night. Everything in the grand hall was ready. Glasses, vodka, the samovar was boiling. At 11 p.m. we heard the sounds of firing and immediately the main ceremonial doors were thrown open and then the words would ring out. This one to Nikolaevsky battery. That meant he was slightly wounded. 
This one to remain here. That meant there would be an amputation. This one to the Gushin house. That meant there was no hope. But bullets, bayonets and shells were not the main killers of the war. Having successfully fought off two attempts to force them back into the sea, the British felt secure in the natural harbour of Balaclava. But they had reckoned without the weather. On November the 14th, 1854, Fanny Jubilee was on board ship in Balaclava Harbour when a hurricane struck. Ships were crushing and crowding together, all adrift, all breaking and grinding each other to pieces. By 10 o'clock, we heard the most frightful rack was going on amongst the ships at anchor, and some of the party started for the rocks. The next tidings were that the Prince, the Resolute, and the Rip Van Winkle, the Wanderer, the Progress, and a foreign bark had all gone down, and out of the hole, not a dozen people saved. 21 British ships and 14 French ships went down in the storm. Most of the army's warm clothing and medical supplies were lost, just as winter began. Lieutenant Richard Llewellyn of the 46th Foot had arrived in Balaclava aboard the Prince with 600 reinforcements for his regiment only a week before. They were now camped out with 25,000 other British soldiers in their summer tents across the plain above Sebastopol. November the 15th. Nothing could stand before the full force of the wind. Clothing, pots and kettles and men in pursuit were whirled away. Eight men of my regiment died during the day and 150 were obliged to go sick. The Prince has been dashed to pieces against the rocks and her cargo, which included 42,000 greatcoats and large store of winter clothing, medicines and ammunition, entirely lost. The authorities say they would sooner have lost two regiments. In fact, the approaching winter would cost the British far more than two regiments. Supplies which weren't sunk in the storm were left rotting in Balaclava Harbour, as a combination of impassably muddy roads and chronic inefficiency prevented their delivery to the front. Two days later, Lieutenant Llewellyn made another note in his journal. November the 17th. I rode to Balaclava today through a sea of mud in which the British army waded to and fro, on foot or ponyback, driving Arabas, oxen, mules, dromedaries engaged in the hopeless task of getting daily food to camp. Here a commissariat wagon had overturned in the mud the day's rations of a regiment. There, a huge gun lay on its side and blocked the way. All the way down, the track was haunted by a string of mules bearing the daily quota of sick men to Scutari and marked by the bodies of the animals that have died in harness. Fanny Jubilee watched with alarm as the British base deteriorated. If anyone should ever wish to erect a model balaclava in England, I will tell him the ingredients necessary. Take a village of ruined houses in the extremest state of all imaginable dirt, allow the rain to pour in until the place is a swamp of filth ankle deep, catch about a thousand sick Turks with a plague and cram them into houses indiscriminately. Kill about a hundred a day and bury them so as to be scarcely covered with earth, leaving them to rot at leisure. Collect from the water all the offal of the animals slaughtered, together with the occasional floating human body, and stew them all together in a narrow harbour, and you will have a tolerable imitation of the real essence of balaclava. As the weather worsened and autumn turned into winter, the British Army found itself bogged down in bureaucracy. The commissariat, which was in charge of providing food and equipment and clothing for the soldiers, was a branch of the Treasury, so that it was always trying to save money. And they had also taken on, as employees, hidebound officials who had no flexibility at all and would allow nothing to be handed out unless they had received forms, often in duplicate, perhaps triplicate. And so it was really curtailed by a series of rules and regulations which unfortunately the people running it were too unimaginative to think they could break. 
With animal fodder among the supplies left to rot in Balaclava Harbour, the starving horses were reduced to eating each other's tails. For the men without adequate rations or warm clothing, trench duty was a nightmare in the long hours of sniper fire and occasional shelling. December the 6th. Today, we count 160 dead out of the 600 men of our regiment who landed a month since. The men have been five nights out of seven in the trenches. All the regiment, not incapacitated by sickness, went into the trenches last night. Returning this morning, they were at once, and without breakfast, sent down to Balaclava on fatigue to carry up bags of biscuits on their backs, whence they are now returning just in time to go into the trenches again tonight. Our men are being worked and starved to death. Their feeble stomachs reject the ration of greasy pork, and we have never got the sugar, rice, or vegetables to which we are entitled. Take with this that the men are usually wet through, that their clothes are torn to pieces, and their wretched government boots soulless, and we have sufficient reason for the death rate. Lieutenant Richard Llewellyn. Many soldiers simply froze to death in their trenches and were only discovered by the next shift. Others were bayoneted where they had fallen asleep from exhaustion while on duty. Indeed, the Russians believed that winter was their strongest ally. As naval officer Piotr Leslie put it, We've got a real Russian winter. There has been such a big snowfall that it comes above the knee, and to add to it, there are frosts at night. There hasn't been such a winter in Sebastopol for a long time. We don't know how to thank God for such weather. It is very unpleasant for our enemy. Of those who have surrendered to us, there hasn't been one whose hands or feet haven't been frostbitten. Our soldiers and sailors are just saying, let the Russian winter get its teeth into the English. Standing knee deep in ice and snow, often for days at a time, was certainly biting its way into what was left of Llewellyn's 600 men. December the 28th. Our regiment is now reduced to 60 duty men. Many have been frozen to death and crippled with frostbite. At Balaclava Hospital, Welsh nurse Elizabeth Davis described the first cases of frostbite she saw in the Crimea. The toes of both the man's feet fell off with the bandages. The hand of another man fell off at the wrist. It was a fortnight to six weeks since the wounds of many of the men had been looked at and dressed. Of the three privates in this picture, William Young on the left was the only one wounded in combat. Henry Burland in the centre suffered frostbite in the trenches. He had his feet amputated at Scutari and his legs at Portsmouth. John Connery, on the far right, survived the battles of the Alma and Inkerman unscathed, but suffered three amputations for frostbite. Many senior officers simply went home for the winter on so-called urgent private affairs. Fanny Jubilee noted in her journal, Lord George Paget is gone home. 38 other officers, profiting by his example, have sent in their papers. While such fair-weather soldiers were warming themselves in their London clubs, some of the rank and file were being flogged for cowardice or shot for desertion. Paget, however, found himself snubbed in his club and returned to the Crimea in the spring. But by then, thousands of his fellow soldiers were no longer alive to greet him. Some images of the war that reached London conveyed the misery of conditions in the field, but others were heavily idealised. Captain Frederick Dallas of the 46th Fort indignantly noticed... An illustrated newspaper with pictures of us here, only dressed as we ought to be, not as we are. I can assure you that to this date, the 12th of January, we have neither the huts, fur hats, boots or anything in the picture. It would be months before such Crimean knitwear as the so-called balaclava woolen helmet and the cardigan were to arrive in the British camp. The best the men could do was to grow their own head warmers. The punch cartoon view of the situation ran... Well, Jack, here's good news from home. We're going to have a medal. Well, that's very kind. Maybe one of these days we'll have a coat to stick it on. As conditions and morale declined, 
Captain Dallas watched the British commanding officer with contempt. Lord Raglan rode up on a sleek horse a day or two ago, and all he remarked was, the artillery horses appear insufficiently clad. God forgive him. Two months ago, he could have got as many ships as he wished and loaded them with wood, with mules from Constantinople, with forage, with in fact every preparation for fighting against winter. But no, nothing was done. He rides rarely through the middle of the camp. The soldiers don't know who he is, and the officers run away to avoid having to salute him. The winter conditions were at nobody's fault, but the commissariat were supposed to provide rations and warm clothing, and had they done so, the effects of the winter would have been very, very much less severe than they were. The responsibility was with the commissary general, Filder, and behind him, of course, was Raglan, and Raglan must take the ultimate responsibility. There's no doubt in my mind that if the Duke of Wellington had been alive and had been commander-in-chief there, then Filder, the commissary general, would have swung from the gallows. If Raglan couldn't see the problem, the Times could. The noblest army ever sent from these shores has been sacrificed to the grossest mismanagement. Incompetence, lethargy, aristocratic auteur, official indifference, favour, routine, perverseness and stupidity, reign, revel and riot in the camp before Sebastopol, in the harbour of Balaclava, in the hospitals of Scutari, and how much nearer home, we do not venture to say. In London, the failure of aristocratic management in the Crimea was seen as a metaphor for the failure of aristocratic management of government generally, and the Times threw its weight decisively behind a campaign to get rid of the current government. This culminated in January 1855 in a vote of confidence in the House of Commons. The government was so heavily defeated that the result was greeted not with the usual cheers and rattling of papers, but merely nervous laughter. British officers and men were more critical of their commanders in the field, as Colonel Charles Ash Wyndham wrote to his brother. I shall be surprised if I see the generals in authority now in the Crimea handed down to posterity as anything but a comfortable, easy-going, gentleman-like set of do-nothings who are only fit to scribble a dispatch to the Secretary of War. If this weather lasts a fortnight, this army is ruined, absolutely. Having seen his regiment decimated, Lieutenant Richard Llewellyn himself fell ill and in March 1855 was shipped home and resigned from the army. Inside the cupboard of the journal he had kept during the campaign, he scribbled one final note. The destruction of my regiment, which was effected during the months of November, December, January and February, was not owing to any shortcoming on the part of the regiment. It was a case of murder. By February 1855, as the siege ended its fourth month, the Allied camp had moved eight miles closer to Sebastopol. The distance from Balaclava simply exacerbated the problem of supplying a camp of 80,000 French troops and 45,000 British. But as the commissariat failed to meet the needs of this huge army, once again, middle-class professionals back home came up with a solution. Florence Nightingale and her nurses had turned the tide of the medical crisis. Now, civilian engineers in Britain offered to build a railway from Balaclava to the front line. The Turks provided 200 Montenegrin and Croatian laborers from the far-flung outposts of their Ottoman Empire to prepare the ground. At the beginning of February, they were joined by 500 skilled navvies who arrived from Britain to lay the track. Soon, Russell was reporting huge progress. The navvies are working away heartily, pulling down the rackety houses near the post office at Balaclava so as to form the terminus of the Grand Crimean Central Railway, with branch line to Sebastopol. 
they have landed a large quantity of barrows, beams, rails, spades, shovels, picks and other materials. On February the 8th, the navvies started to lay the first rails. I was astonished to see the progress of the railway. The navvies work famously and do more work in a day than a regiment of English soldiers do in a week. To be sure, the navvies have yet in them the stamina of English living, which has long since been worked out of our poor fellows. Captain Henry Clifford. On February the 23rd, the first load of commissariat stores was carried from Balaclava to the British camp. A fortnight later, the photographer Roger Fenton arrived in Balaclava. Fenton was the 36-year-old son of an MP and a founder member of the Royal Photographic Society. On reading of the war, he was keen to go and see for himself. I resolved to go at once to the front and take Sebastopol by photography. Fenton had photographed the royal family, and this connection eased his introduction to the high command in the Crimea. It may also have inclined him to a less critical portrait of the war than he had read in the papers. Everything seems in much better order than the Times led me to expect. There is great activity with the railway workers. Here, a stationary engine is being erected to drag bricks up the hill, where the road is at present steep, and huts are growing up very fast for the timekeeper and workmen. Among the supplies belatedly arriving in the camp was winter clothing. Fenton persuaded some of the officers to dress up in it for his camera. By the time it arrived, however, it was far too warm to wear. Once again, the commissariat had done too little, too late. The Russians inside Sebastopol were also receiving supplies and reinforcements. One new arrival was a 26-year-old artillery officer, Leo Tolstoy. In a letter to his brother, he wrote, Dear Sergei, I'll give you an idea of the state of our affairs in Sebastopol. The town is besieged from one side, the south, where we had no fortifications when the enemy approached it. Now we have more than 500 big caliber guns on this side and several lines of earthworks, positively impregnable. I spent a week in the fortress and the last day used to lose my way among these labyrinths of batteries, as though in a forest. The enemy can't get any further. At the slightest advance, he's showered with a hailstorm of missiles. The siege never succeeded in completely cutting off Sebastopol, and a second Russian army hovered nearby, harassing the Allies and keeping supply lines to the city open. Russian sailors, their ships sunk to blockade the Allied Navy, helped man the city's defences. Lieutenant Captain Piotr Leslie looked confidently at the enemy outside the city walls. We now have two Sebastopols, and there isn't much difference between them. The other Sebastopol has even outdone the real Sebastopol. If the newspapers are to be believed, a railway has been built there. But from our heights, you can't see it yet. And how marvelous it will be when we drive them away and the railway and wooden huts remain in our hands. Outside the city, Roger Fenton was equally envious of the Russian defenses. Up to the present time, the Russians have decidedly the best of it. That, that, that is the siege, though whenever they attack, they lose heaps of men. Every morning sees some fresh work commenced all finished by the Russians. Sometimes a new rifle pit is finished in the night, sometimes two or more are connected together by a trench so as to form a kind of advanced battery. Often between attacks, a burial truce was arranged so that the no-man's land which separated the two front lines could be cleared of the dead and dying. William Howard Russell described one such occasion in The Times. The sight was strange beyond description. French, English and Russian officers were walking about saluting each other courteously as they passed and occasionally entering into conversation and a constant interchange of little civilities such as offering and receiving cigar lights was going on in each little group. But while all this civility was going on, we were walking among the dead over blood-stained ground covered with evidence of the recent fight and through the midst of the crowd stalked a solemn procession of soldiers bearing their departed comrades to their long home. After such brief respites, trench warfare resumed with a vengeance. Captain Hugh Hibbert of the 7th Fusiliers likened the men going down to the trenches to sheep en route for the slaughterhouse. 
not knowing when it will come to one's own turn to receive an ounce of lead for breakfast, or about six pounds of iron in the stomach as a cure for the cholera. Morale among the Allied troops was low. Boredom was setting in, and there was a feeling that anything would be better than this interminable game of cat and mouse. My dear mother, I do not know when we are to get out of this place or take Sebastopol. I'm heartily sick of the trenches, new batteries, new mortars, and I don't know what else. And the Russians, as bad if not worse than ever. There is no honor or glory to be got in the trenches, where you sit and smoke your pipe and maybe get shot by a sharpshooter. I would 10,000 times sooner fight a couple of decent battles in the field than go shave your head with a miss twice a week and no good done by it. For I say Sebastopol never will be taken until invested. And where are the men to do that? Lieutenant William Young, 29th of March, 1855. At least the railway ensured there was no shortage of ammunition. On Easter Monday, April the 9th, the Allies began their second bombardment of the besieged city. General Semyakin of the Russian infantry wrote to his wife that evening. At five past five in the morning, the gentlemen Europeans opened fire along the entire line of Sebastopol's fortifications. And both sides began to ring out with thousands of guns of large caliber. The photographer, Roger Fenton, went out to watch the bombardment. The ground here is covered with cannonballs, and I took care to keep well behind the hill in going down, for I could hear the whir, and thus that the balls were coming up the ravine on each side. The 68 pounders especially almost burst the ears, and the shot from them sounded like an express train that had broken off the line and leapt up into the air. The shot and shell did not disturb me, so much as the awful clangor, as if all hell had broken loose and the legions of Lucifer were fighting in the air. I could only see the Russian redoubt indistinctly. The mist was so thick and the smoke hung heavily, but it was easy to see that they were not firing one gun to our four. It must have been uncomfortable in their quarters. Just five days later, Semyakin wrote another letter. The situation in Sebastopol remains the same, with ceaseless artillery fire from both sides. It is sad on the heart, but Sebastopol still stands. Everything broken or ruined during the day is repaired overnight, despite the firing, so that by morning it is as though nothing has happened. Leo Tolstoy was posted to the fourth bastion, the most dangerous of Sebastopol's fortifications. Between shifts, he worked on three short stories, the Sebastopol sketches, which were published during the siege. Despite being fiction, they were to earn the young writer a reputation as a war correspondent to rival Russell's. April the 14th, I'm living in Sebastopol. Our losses already amount to 5,000, but we're holding out not merely well, but in such a way that our defense must clearly prove to the enemy the impossibility of ever taking Sebastopol. In the evening, wrote two pages of Sebastopol sketches. Yesterday, a shell exploded near a boy and girl who were playing horses in the street. They put their arms around each other and fell down together. The war had become a stalemate. Sebastopol had been under siege for six months with no end in sight for either side. Tolstoy began writing his second story of the siege, Sebastopol in May. Six months have now passed since the first cannonball came hurtling over from the bastions of Sebastopol to churn up the earth on the enemy's works. Ever since then, thousands of shells, cannonballs and bullets have been fired from the bastions of the enemy trenches and from those trenches back at the bastions. And the angel of death has hovered ceaselessly above them. But the dispute which the diplomats have failed to settle is proving to be even less amenable to settlement by means of gunpowder and human blood. Britain and France had been at war with Russia for a year, but the war was to continue for another 12 months. 